Well, come on, somebody. Let's give the Isaacs another good hand clap right now. What's not to like about the Isaacs? Come on, somebody. Give them a good God bless you. Now, while you're standing, give a hand clap of praise to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. I love the music of the Isaacs. I really do. Gwen and I think they're just about our favorite gospel singing group. And uh, Gwen could listen to them sing. Mama's teaching angels how to sing all day long. And I can't wait to get my hands on that book. I want to read that book. And you need to take the book and that CD home with you today. It will bless your life. I bring you greetings from the church I've served for the past 43 years, Calvary Church, Irving, Texas. I uh, share with you the fact that there are a lot of people in Dallas, Texas today who are thinking about Nashville. They know that I am here, and they know that Pastor Mari is celebrating the dedication of this beautiful edifice over this great weekend. And the, you know, Calvary Church in Irving, Texas, They've never met a Davis that they didn't love. And so they're in love with Maury Davis, and they're especially in love with Gail Davis. Uh, you know, when, when Maury Davis <laughs> married Gail Daniels and took her away and brought her to Nashville, I don't think Calvary Church has really forgiven him to this day uh, because we lost a treasure. She was the most beautiful girl in the church and played the piano like somebody from another world. And uh, Mari and Gail Davis, they're an incredible team of God's servants. And it's just a blessing for me to be here today and bring you greetings from Calvary Church to all of the good people of Calvary. And the, everybody at Calvary wa also wants me to give a shout out to Elmer Conyus and Bobby Frader because uh, they are two of our hometown boys that we really love and miss. But glad they are here with you at Cornerstone. I love this new building. My wife Gwen and I had the opportunity to come over and have lunch in what I call the Taj Mahal of lobbies. I had lunch there yesterday. And then Pastor Mari gave us a tour of the facilities. It's one of the most incredible and remarkable facilities that I have ever seen in the work of God. There, is, there was no stone left unturned. There was nothing left in complete Everything that needed to be done was done. And Cornerstone, you are to be commended for the hard work you have done and for your sacrificial giving and for your faithfulness. Come on, let's give the Lord a good hand clap because it's done. This building is completed. And we thank God. Credit belongs to the pastoral leadership of this church. Credit belongs to the faithful board members and members of the building committee and all of the people who have had any part whatsoever in the culmination of this magnificent project. God bless you and thank you for allowing me the honor of being with you this weekend. Looking forward with a lot of excitement to tomorrow night. A lot of our friends are going to be here and you'll miss something special if you miss tomorrow night. Don't miss it whatever you do. Today, I ask you to look with me in three directions simultaneously. I ask you to look to the past. I ask you to look to the present. And I ask you to look to the future. When you look to the past, you look behind you. When you look to the present, you look around you. When you look to the future, you look ahead of you. You look to the past for the purpose of review. You look to the present for the purpose of survey. You look to the future for the purpose of visualization. If you know what happened in the past, you have hindsight. If you know what is happening around you, you have insight. If you know what is going to happen ahead of you, you have foresight. I've long believed that the past is a cancel check. And the future is a promissory note. 
And the present is the only cash you have, and you should spend it wisely. So today we look to the past, but not for long. It would be emotionally unhealthy if we longed to return to the past. If we linger too long in the past, it could cause us spiritual and emotional problems. So we look to the past only long enough to remind ourselves of the victories of the past and to remember the great lessons that we've learned in the past. Will Rogers said, quit looking over your shoulder because that ain't where you're going. I agree with Will Rogers. So I've titled my talk today, The Thrill of Going From Here to There. So we're not trying to regress, we're trying to progress. We don't want to go back, we want to go forward. We want to go from where we are to the place God wants us to be. The completion of this building is not the end of the project. It's just the beginning. In fact, it's just the beginning of the end. Because the great work that God will enable you to do because of this building is yet to be done. So there is a particular thrill when we go from here to there, particularly when there is someplace we have never been before. So I will challenge you today to quit looking to the past and to just stop looking all around you all the time and focus your eyes upon the future to see that place called there that God wants you to travel to. I go to 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2, 3, and 4. It reads like this, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And verse 3 said, Leave here. This is the word of God to Elijah. He said, Leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine. East of the Jordan, verse 4 said, you will drink from the brook, and I have ordained the ravens to feed you there. Where will the ravens be? There. Where will the brook be flowing with crystal clear water? There. The ravens will bring the food there. Where are they going to get the food? I don't know, and I don't care just so the beat-up birds get there with the food. Because God said, I've commanded them, I've ordered them to bring the food there to that place. To fully understand what I'm talking about, you've got to get acquainted with this Old Testament king named Ahab. He was married to a gorgeous girl named Jezebel. She was not the most easy-to-like girl, but she was gorgeous nevertheless. She was, however, as ungodly and as abominable as was her husband, King Ahab. She was an idolatrous woman. Ahab was a pagan, abominable ruler. He was a worshiper of Baal. He was also a worshiper of the gods of the grove. And he worshiped assorted other gods that the pagan people around Israel worshiped at that time. He and Jezebel were co-conspirators in crime. And they were like co-rulers. He was the king and she was the first lady. They were the king of idolatry in the nation of Israel for 22 years. And it was during the reign of King Ahab that Israel was suffering from an excruciating famine. The famine throughout the land was the result of a torturous drought. Not like the city of Dallas that has had rain most of the days in the past 30 days, but like a city without water, a country without rain. And God gave Elijah a supernatural plan of survival in the midst of the drought. And God's word to Elijah was simple. You will survive if you obey me. Your blessing will come to you if you hear what I say and do what I say. So God was saying to him, go from where you are to where you need to be. Go from here to there. Go down to the Kareth Ravine. Hide yourself there. There will be plenty of water flowing in the brook, and water is the elixir of life. 
There's nothing better for your system than water. And God said, you'll have all of the water you can drink. And God said, I've commanded the ravens to feed you. He said, the ravens will bring you fresh meat and fresh bread every morning and every evening. You'll have carbohydrates. You'll have protein. You'll have everything you need for a balanced diet. And stay there until I tell you to go someplace else. So Elijah did what God told him to do. He activated his faith. He obeyed God. He went down to the rook, and the ravens brought him bread and meat at a place called there. Elijah's provision depended upon his obedience. No obedience to God's command, no provision. And today, Cornerstone, God is speaking to you. I do not question the fact that I come today with a word from God's throne. And this is not particularly the message that I would bring. But it is the message that I know God has sent me to bring to this place. And your ability to hear it and your willingness to receive it will absolutely determine your spiritual destiny and your journey in God in the years ahead. This is an order from God. You individually, and the church called Cornerstone collectively must prepare to move from here to there. Now, when I talk about moving, I don't talk about a geographical transition. I'm not talking about picking up everything you have and moving from Nashville to Dallas. Uh, that is a pleasant thought. But that's not what I'm telling you to do because that's not what God is telling you to do. God is saying, move from here to there. It's a spiritual transition. It's a transition that embodies obedience. It's a transition that will enable you to hear what God is saying, do what God is saying, and receive the provision of your life. Moving from here to there involves a change of mindset. For some of you, it may be an attitude adjustment. For others, it's a bold and daring step of faith. For somebody else, it may be something so simple as an act of obedience. For somebody else, it may be a commitment to a cause. But God is saying to you today, this is no time to stop. This is not time to stop or slow down. I know, I know you've been involved in getting this building finished. I know you've been involved in this project for a long time. I know you may have given until you think you can't give anymore. I know that you may have worked until you think you can't work anymore. Your strength is depleted. Your energy is gone. But we're in a war, ladies and gentlemen. The war is not over. Our nation is fighting a values war. We are fighting a war against doubt and fear. Our war is not against the devil. Our war is against unbelief. And so we must stay strong in faith. And you can't stop giving because all the giving has not been done. And you can't stop serving because all of the serving has not been done. And you can't stop witnessing because all of the witnessing has not been done. The call of God for you, Cornerstone Church, is to change this city and to touch this nation. And it hasn't been done. So the building is just a tool that God has put in your hands. You say, well, God had a little help in getting it here. Indeed, he did. He had your help. And God bless you and thank you for everything you have done. Uh, but this is a tool a tool that enables this church to transition into the next sphere of ministry. Until every soul in Nashville, Texas, is a born-again believer, your work is not done. Until this nation has been turned upside down to the glory of our God, this work is not done. 
So God assured the prophet Elijah that his provision would be there. And God is assuring you that your provision will be there where God positions you and tells you to be. It's not as if God is telling you to do something so he can bless it. On the other hand, it seems to me that God is telling you to go where the blessing is. Go where the blessing is in your mind, in your spirit. Activate your faith. Go where the blessing is and get ready to receive the provision of the master's hand. So for some people, it may be a matter as simple as just making up your mind that Cornerstone is the place God has for you. You may have been coming for a few weeks. Today may be your first time ever in this house. And you're kind of feeling good about it. You may have come for a few weeks, and you've been thinking about becoming part of this church. You've been dabbling in the brook of Cornerstone for a few weeks, but you have yet to make up your mind and make a commitment that this is the place for you. And so for you, it may be God is saying, your place called there is right here at Cornerstone Church. And you need to get out of the way and let God's will be done in your life and move into the area where God is telling you to move so that you can be positioned where the blessing is. You know, it's like a it's it's like a professional football quarterback, a quarterback in the NFL. He throws the football on a passing play, not to where the receiver is. He throws the football to where the receiver is going to be. Come on up here and bring me that football, Galen Davis. I want to illustrate this. There's a little confusion in the minds of some people. And i got to make it clear to you what I'm talking about. Thank you, Galen. Stand right here and don't move until I tell you to. Thank you very much. Yeah, you worked for me as a youth pastor. Once a youth pastor, always a youth pastor. Your dad used to work for me as a youth pastor. He's still a youth pastor. Can I get a witness? You're still a youth pastor when you're telling the youth pastor what to do. How many know what I'm talking about? This ball seems to be a little bit overinflated. So um, I don't know. I think we need to. I think we need to call the equipment manager of the Boston Patriots and see if he can deflate this ball just a little bit. If you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to ask you in just a few minutes, Galen, to. Come in this direction. I want you to come here. Be careful about the edge of the stage, right? Then I want you to make an abrupt left turn. There is an X right here that marks the spot. You know, while you're over here, over here by the edge of the stage, I'll be throwing the football to a place called there. There is right here. And so it's your assignment to be here when the the ball gets here. Can I get a witness? You ready to do it? Uh, Get your coat off. Come on, somebody. How many believe Galen Davis is up to the challenge? You ready to go, Dalen? Hut, two, three, four. Oh, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this. Come on. He deserves a better applause than that. My goodness gracious. He performed just like a millionaire wide receiver in the NFL. And that's a little bit above your pay grade, if you know what I mean. Can I get a witness? I think we need to do it again, don't you? And I want to hear a robust roar of of applause if if he pulls this off again. If Galen Davis catches this ball, if he gets to the place called there, X marks the spot, he deserves a big applause. I know it depends upon my expertise as a passer. That's a done deal. Can I get a witness? All right. Hut, two, three, four. Oh, come on, come on, come on, mercy. (laughs) All right, all right, all right, all righty. Come on, one more hand, a a big hand clap of, of God bless you, and thank you to Galen Davis. So how do we get from here to there? How do we go to the place called there? Well, it requires the activation of faith. You can only reach the place called there when you activate your faith. 
Hebrews 11, of course, is the classic New Testament chapter of faith because it teaches us how to go from here to there. Our goal should be, of course, to possess the faith of God or to, def- to, to possess the God kind of faith. I learned about faith from the apostle of faith, the late Kenneth E. Hagin Sr. I learned about faith, and he would customarily call it the God kind of faith or the faith of God or complete faith or perfect faith. He's talking about Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where the writer of the Hebrews said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He is saying that faith is more than just a feeling. Our faith is more than just some sugary sweet flavor in your mouth or in your brain. He is saying that faith is a substance and faith is evidence. If you have faith, you have evidence. If you have faith, you have substance. Because when you activate your faith, you're able to believe before you see it. When you activate your faith, you're able to obey before you understand it. When you activate your faith, you're able to give before you even have it. When you activate your faith, You're able to persevere before you receive it. When you activate your faith, you're able to shout before you even possess it. So how can you do that? You do it because you have the evidence. You have it in your heart. You have it in your hand. Elijah had it when God spoke to him. When God said, go to the place called there, because I've commanded the ravens to feed you. I've commanded the brook to flow. So go to that place. When you activate your faith, you're able to do what you never thought before that you could do. You're able to give more than you ever thought you could give. And I want to be so bold today, and I believe I speak prophetically, As I tell you that somebody ought to be writing a check for a million dollars to help defray the cost of this building. And they ought to be writing a check right now because I've never seen a building project finished without a huge tsunami of bills that come due, boom, as soon as the building is finished and occupied. And so I haven't talked to Pastor Davis about this. But I know that if this building project is anything like any of the building projects I've ever been involved in, there are a lot of bills that come in right at the end, and somebody needs to be giving a sizable offering, and somebody ought to give a million dollars, and somebody ought to give less than a million dollars, but somebody ought to be writing some checks right now to defray some of those late arriving bills and take a little bit of the pressure off the leadership of this church Because I have a word from God for you when I tell you that when you do the impossible, it's only done because you have seen the invisible. And when you see the invisible, you see it through the eye of faith. The Bible said about Moses that he forsook Egypt and forsook the pleasures of sin for a season because he had seen the one who is invisible. And when you see the unrelenting goodness of God and the unmitigated favor of God in your life, you will know that God does it. You will have seen the invisible. And I don't care whether or not you're an Olympic sprinter. You can't run fast enough to escape the favor of God. God's favor and God's abundance and God's provision will stalk you and track you down and supply for you when you move from here to there. Come on, somebody, and give God a clap offering of praise in this house. There must be an activation of your faith. Now, number two, write this down if you're taking notes. There must be a willingness to change. Yeah, I said change. You said, well, you know, we think we've done that. We've changed the face of this facility dramatically. And indeed, you have. But I'm telling you, that in this world of ours, knowledge is doubling every 18 months. 
And if you're reading a book that's over 18 months old, you're reading a book that's out of date. And because of this cataclysmic change that our culture is making, you've got to position yourself not to be locked into one mindset or to stay at one particular spot mentally or spiritually, but you've got to be willingness to change and flow with God for the future. Because in the future, you cannot be contented with doing things the way that you've always done them. You know, I was here for the 10th anniversary celebration of Pastor Davis. You're doing things differently now than you were then. I was here for the 20th anniversary celebration of Pastor Davis. You're doing things differently now than you were then. And 10 years from now or 10 months from now, things are going to be changing around you. And we must be willing to take some risks. You got to be willing to embrace variety. Because what works for you at Cornerstone this year, in the year 2015, may not work for you next year in the year 2016. And you'll take risks if you love what is at stake. You will only take a risk. I'm talking about risking losing something or risking being misunderstood or risking being criticized. You will only take a risk for what you love. And if you don't love lost souls, you won't take a risk to reach those lost souls. But if you love the lost, if you love the broken, if you love the burdened, if you love the beat up and the bedraggled, if you love derelict humanity, and I know you do, then you must be willing to take a risk to reach them. George Barna, the, the guru of church growth in America, says there are only two kinds of churches in America today, and they are changing churches and dying churches. And some churches are dying by degrees. The rattle of death is in their throat. And because they refuse to change, they are dead and don't even know it. So it reminds me of a man named Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh lived for 37 years before taking his own life. They were 37 tormenting years. He lived from 1853 to 1890. As a young man, young Vincent desired to be in the ministry because his father and his grandfather were both Reformed Dutch ministers. So he knew something about the ministry. It's not like he didn't know what he was getting into. He understood ministry. And he desired to be in the ministry, but he tried unsuccessfully on four different occasions to pass the entrance exam to the local semi seminary. And because he was unable to go to seminary, he concluded that God did not want him to go into ministry. So Vincent Van Gogh then decided to become a painter. And he became a painter of considerable celebration and recognition. Perhaps his most famous painting, even though it achieved notoriety after his death. But it's arguably the most famous painting of Vincent van Gogh. It's the painting called The Church at Auvers. You can check it out on the big screen. This painting depicted a church with no doors. Uh, the road splits in front of the church and then apparently reconnects on the backside of the church. Uh, the road bypasses the church on either side of the church. A townswoman walks by the church but doesn't bother to go in. Uh, demonstrating that the townspeople who pass the church have no reason to go in. With no doors, the people on the outside can't get in. And the people on the inside can't get out. So whatever is of value inside the church cannot be accessed by the people on the outside. 
uh, because those inside the church can't get it to the people on the outside. And whatever the people on the outside need cannot be given by those on the inside because they can't get out. So the church sits in the middle of the road as something that is just ignored and bypassed. You see it on the screen. The church is a dark, obstructing presence. It is a lifeless relic that people bypass in order to avoid its cold, dark, and inhibiting shadow. The church at Over. Sadly, it's a picture of many churches today. Lighthouses of the past that I have known have become cold and empty, just relics of a bygone era because people refuse to change. I wonder what Van Gogh would paint today to depict the modern church. I think I have an idea. I think it would be discouraging because in my lifetime, many great churches of the past have all too often become stale and tired and predictable. Still, there are other churches that in an attempt to connect with culture have gone too far and they have bartered their values upon the altar of expediency. It's like in the book entitled The Kind of Preaching God Blesses, written by Stephen J. Lawson. He writes this, The stress to become booming ministries has never been greater. Influenced by corporate mergers, towering skyscrapers, expanding economies, bigger is perceived as better. And nowhere is this mentality more evident than in the church. And sad to say, the pressure to sacrifice the centrality of biblical preaching is now being made on the altar of man-made pragmatism. A new way of doing church is emerging. And in this radical paradigm shift, the exposition of the Bible is now being replaced by entertainment. And preaching is being replaced with performance. And, per, and doctrine is being replaced with drama. And theology is being replaced with theatrics. The pulpit, which was once the focal point of the church, is now being overshadowed by a variety of church growth techniques. Everything from trendy music to glitzy vaudeville pageantries are being used by a new wave of pastors who see the gospel not as good news to be proclaimed, but as a product to be sold to consumers. And so today's church is all too often like the church in Van Gogh's painting. It's there, but nobody seems to notice, and nobody seems to care. Nobody's going in, nobody's coming out. And my cry to you is we must be willing to change. I'm not talking about being faddish. I'm not talking about embracing every religious fad that comes trucking down the road. Because every pastor will have an opportunity to embrace half a dozen religious fads every year that come your way. But this church, like the church I serve, has refused to follow after religious fads. God bless you and thank you for hearing the word of God from your leaders. But while we ignore fads, we must embrace trends. Fads remain only for a season. Trends remain for the long haul. And I believe that increased cultural relevancy must never occur at the expense of biblical authenticity. I believe we must connect with culture. Yes, I do. But I believe we must never contradict the Word of God, and we must never compromise God's Word, and we must never spend 
the authenticity of God's Word for the sake of reaching culture. Today's church must grow in both cultural relevancy and biblical authenticity. And thank God you have a pastor like Pastor Mari Davis who is quite willing indeed to tell it like it is. He is unashamed and without equivocation when it comes to a bold declaration of the gospel. Thank God for Pastor Maury Davis. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5 talks about the message that God gave the children of Israel. They're on the banks of the Jordan, and, and the next day they will begin to walk into the Jordan and cross the Jordan to go into the promised land. And Joshua spoke to all of the camps of Israel the day before, and he said, Joshua 3, verse 5, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He's saying, change some things. Get some stuff out of your lives. Get rid of some stuff. Come under the authority that is before you. Get ready for God to move. He is saying, go from here to there. Because tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Hmm. I've got a word for Cornerstone Church. Hmm. About to preach myself happy right now. But I've got a word for you. And the word is you haven't seen it all yet. You haven't seen yet what God wants to do through this church. There is so much more that God wants to show you. And there is so much more that God wants to do through you. There is so much more that God is going to accomplish by those who hear the voice of God, who walk obediently before God, and who are willing to go from here to there. You can't be like the people in the little country of Honduras who had the bridge to nowhere. Now, you see that bridge on the big screen. That bridge doesn't go anywhere. And that's because Honduras, under the influence of Hurricane Mitch in 1998, was subjected to 24 hours of rainfall. It rained for 24 hours straight. It rained 75 inches of rain in 24 hours. And the whole landscape of Honduras was covered by water to the degree that the bridge that had just recently been opened across the river was not going across the river anymore. But when the waters receded, to the astonishment and to the disappointment and to the chagrin of the people of Honduras who had built that bridge and paid for that bridge, they discovered the river had changed its course. And because the river changed its course, the, the bridge was of no value. But I'm quite certain that some of the people of Honduras must have said, oh, yeah, the bridge is still good. Yeah, we can still use the bridge. For crying out loud, it costs us a lot of money. You know, you got to understand that we worked hard to build that bridge. And so we can't just ignore it, and we certainly can't bomb it, and can't, don't have enough money to build another one, so we got to use that bridge. And so, you know, let's build some rope ladders, and we can climb up on top of it. It's sound. It's structurally sound. It's solid. And we can climb up on top of it, and we can't cross the river from there, but we can see on the other side of the river to the place that we would really like to go. We can't go there, but we can see where we would like to go. You ever seen a church like that? church that's not going there, but where, from where they are, they can see it, and other people see it, and they're building a bridge to get there. Uh, no, but, you know, if we built a church and it suddenly became obsolete because the river changed its course, how many of us would argue for the continued use of the church? Oh, it's a, it's a great church. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful church. Hey, nobody has a church like this. Nobody has a bridge like ours. Nobody has a church like ours. It's so cool, and, and it's got all the structure it's got all the mechanics. It's got all of the equipment. It's got all of the systems. So we can't get rid of what we work so hard to get. But all of the time, we recognize this old system won't get us to the other side. Uh, the only thing 
that needs to happen to the beat up bridge to nowhere is somebody needs to put a few sticks of dynamite under every column that sustains that bridge and count down and pull the trigger and bomb that bridge until there's no bridge left and then clean up the rubble and build a new bridge that crosses the river so we don't have to just sit on one side of the river and look to the other side where we would like to go. I've got a word for some churches. I know I'm preaching to the choir right now because you don't need to know about how to destroy the old in order to, to embrace the new, but there's somebody in here. There's somebody hearing me. There's somebody that needs to hear the message. You need to bomb that sucker and get rid of it and and build something new and build something exciting that'll take you to the other side. Come on, church. Give God a hand clap of praise in this place. And that's what you've done. You bombed the old bridge. And I preached first here in 1991 in the little church over on the hillside. And then I preached a little bit later at the tabernacle over by the street. And then a little later, I preached in the gymnasium. And you keep bombing old bridges and building new ones. And then I came back to preach when this building was opened and dedicated. And now I'm here after you've just finished the Taj Mahal of church buildings, and I'm saying thank God for you, Cornerstone. Oh, come on, somebody. This is a three-kick sermon right now. One, two, three. Come on and give God praise in this place. Because the new is better than the old. And the place called there is better than the place over here. Well, uh, let's wrap it up by let me, letting me give you one more thought. You know, we need an activation of our faith. We need a willingness to change. But we also need an assurance of victory. So many have written off America as a post-Christian nation. But it may be more accurate to say that Christianity is post-American because I believe America can be reborn. I believe America can be reclaimed. I believe Christianity will outlast America. I live with an intense sense of optimism. I am incurably and unapologetically optimistic because Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I claim a blood-washed America and a worldwide awakening. This renewal that I believe is coming to America will not be the color of a white man or a black man, but it will be the blood-red color of Jesus' blood. We must be people of unshakable optimism with a tenacity of faith that endures. We must be aware that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, the good news is every person in this house and every person hearing me, wherever you are right now, you have an assignment. You have an assignment in God's kingdom because you are very special. You're not just an accident looking for a place to happen. You're not just a biological mistake. You're a product of God's inventive genius. You're not just one in a million. You are one in eight and one half billion. There is nobody else like you. You don't yet know your fullest potential in God, but I've come to Cornerstone today to tell you who you are and to tell you about your potential. You've got to have the assurance of victory. And you only have that when you know who you are. I want you to know who you are in the balcony, on the lower floor, in the upper tier, across to the right wing. I want you to know who you are. You've got to understand that to have an assurance of victory. But not only do I want you to know who you are, I want Pastor Maury Davis to know who you are. You may think you know yourself, Pastor Maury. You know, the devil thought he knew you. That day I walked into the Dallas County Jail and found you as an 18-year-old speed freak charged with a horrendous crime. The devil thought that you were down for the count and out of the fight. 
But God had other things in mind, and he raised you up and brought you out, and the rest is history. Come on, somebody, and give God praise for Pastor Maury Davis. Young Galen Davis, you got to know who you are. In the first hours of your life on this planet, your father and I were in an automobile driving behind an ambulance going from one hospital to another one in Dallas. The Baylor Hospital in Irving, Texas, they said, we can't, we can't do what needs to be done for this baby. You and your sisters were just hours old, and they're fine. Their lungs are working fine. But your lungs were underdeveloped, and you couldn't breathe. And we had to go to Methodist Community Hospital where they had experts in excellent medical care. And the devil thought that he could kill you because of lungs that would not function. But God had something else in mind. And he raised you up, and here you are to the glory of God. And I got to talk to Dylan Davis, my young friend Dylan, with whom I have traveled the high roads of America. I have traveled with you from one end of this country to another end. And I have seen you at work on the seat of a two-wheeled motorcycle, driving it like a man from another world. <laughs> and I have remembered that in the first year of your life, in the hospital right here in Nashville, I stood on one side of the bed and your dad stood on the other side of the bed. And the doctor said, this baby needs open heart surgery. And your dad and I put our hands on your body and prayed that God would raise you up. The devil thought he would kill you because of a heart that wouldn't function. But God had another plan. And here you are. Come on, somebody. You got to know who you are. You got to understand who you are. And I'm speaking to every child of God in this house when I tell you that you are a saint, you're a trophy of Calvary's conquest. I'm talking to you. You're born again of imperishable and incorruptible seed. You're a new creation complete in Christ. You're a child of God, the apple of your Father's eye. You are one with the Lord. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost. You are forgiven of your sins and you are eternally redeemed. You are seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. You are dead to sin and alive to God. You are free from guilt and condemnation. You are righteous and you are holy and you are blameless and you are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and you are hidden with Christ in God. You are loved with an everlasting love. You are the head and not the tail. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are a competent minister of the new covenant. Oh, come on. Give God a hand clap of praise in this house. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about who you are in Christ. I've got more. I got to tell you, you are bona fide and you are qualified. Go ahead and remain standing. You are chosen by God and you are anointed. You are his royal ambassador. You are, you are a missionary to a lost world. You're a stranger on this earth, but you're a citizen of heaven. You're not looking back, but you're pressing on the upward way. You're destined to have finished in you that which the Father has begun. You are a king and a priest 
of the Most High God. You're as bold as a lion, and you are more than a conqueror. You are a towering testimony of God's mighty power and grace. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. You are the sweet savor of His grace to those who are suffering. You are a tree planted by the rivers of water. You are a branch whose leaf will not wither. You are a disciple whom Jesus loves. You are a king's kid and you are destined to reign. Now come on somebody and give God praise in this house right now. I'm talking about who you are. You are somebody going somewhere. Uh, when I looked at Maury Davis for the first time, mm, that drugged out teenager looking through the bars and just dripping with hostility. And I'm thinking he's a nobody going nowhere. But God said, oh, no, you are wrong. He has been forgiven. He has been redeemed. And today he's a blood-bought, bona fide, born-again child of the living God. Come on, somebody, and so are you. You came out of darkness. You came into the light. You came from nowhere into somewhere. You came from here, and you've gone to there. And one more time, give God a clap offering in this place. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the living God. I'm asking you to bow your heart and your head with me in prayer. Today, God, somebody in this house needs a Savior so desperately. Just like Pastor Maury needed a Savior in that jail cell many years ago, somebody needs a Savior. So I ask you to come into the heart of every person who reaches out to you in faith and as faith is being activated across this house. Bring men and women, sons and daughters, young and old alike, into the kingdom of God. Now pray this prayer with me, every head bowed, every eye closed. Pray it out loud. Say it like this. Dear God, I come in the name of Jesus. I confess my need of you. Come into my heart. Take all my sin away. I repent of my sin. I receive you as my Savior. I am born again in Christ. God, you're my Father. Jesus, you're my Savior. And I am redeemed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, come on and give him one more clap offering of praise in this place. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, my pastor, Pastor Don George. Mm. I want you to stop doing that leg kick. I worry you're going to hurt something. <laughs> I love my pastor's preaching. Be seated. Oh, my goodness. Pastor, thank you so much for taking us on a journey and challenging us to keep running the race. It's a good word. It's a good word for the church. It's a good word for you. It's a good word for me. God's brought us through a lot, but he's still got more for us to do. In just a moment, we're going to receive an offering for Pastor George and his ministry. I think Pastor George travels more today than he did uh, when I worked for him 20 years ago. I think the other day in about a three-week period, you were in Singapore. Where were we, give me that list. Do you remember it? Uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka, and you flew back to Dallas, then flew to Mexico the next week and started all over again. And uh, he is traveling. He just got back from Moscow where he did a pastor's conference over there. Uh, while I was in, uh, where did you send me? The Philippines. I was in the Philippines. He went to Moscow. And uh, it, just so you know, he actually hooked me up and sent me over there. And as I was laying in Motel 2 looking at the gecko on the wall eating the flies, I thought, yeah, you're in Moscow, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and I'm in Rojas. Yeah, it's all right. God's good. 
I want you to get your offering ready, and, and I'm going to make all the announcements while you're giving, but I want us to bless the man of God. The Bible said if we have received spiritual things, we ought to return it in financial support, and it's just very clear that that's our responsibility. How many of you going to go eat today? How many of you going to leave without paying? <laughs> I have some friends I'll introduce you to. It's called Iron Gates University. I want you to be faithful to God in your giving. You always are. And let's bless my pastor. What do you say? Take your offering out or write your check to Cornerstone Church. We'll give as unto the Lord. I'm going to talk to you, and then we're going to dismiss you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the privilege of supporting a man's ministry. And I thank you for a man that has been the father and the mentor to hundreds of churches and pastors. Thousands of preachers around the world have been blessed. And this church has been blessed by his spiritual oversight, wisdom, and guidance. So he shared the word with us today. God let us share back in such a way that his life is blessed and his ministry continues to go around the world. Pray you would do it in Christ's name. God bless you as you give. Ladies, just want to make you aware that on the last Sunday of August, August the 24th, we have an incredible ladies' ministry event that night. Charlotte Gamble will be with us in service that Sunday morning, and Charlotte and Natalie Grant will be in service that night, and the tickets are available at the information booth. Make sure you stop by and do that. I have been told that a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Cap is in the house, one of the grand old Opry members. Where is Jimmy Cap? Where is Jimmy? Somebody show me where Jimmy is. Where is he at? Is he up there? All the way at the back by there. Jimmy, you must have been a Baptist in your former life. It is an honor to have you in church today. Thank you for being here. It's also an honor. Yeah, good to have him here. Jimmy Yeary is right over here. Jimmy is uh, the truck guy. I think you did that song, uh, I Drive Your Truck, and it's good to have you over here, and I'm sure you're the one that taught Sonia how to sing. It's good to have you and your family here in church. Thank you for letting your wife come to the early service, and you let the baby uh, sleep a little longer since I understand you all had a long night. And, uh, yeah, so it's good to have you all here today. A lot of things going on. Church, I want us to fill this house tomorrow night. You're going to want to get here a little bit early. All the people are coming. And when we put out on social media that Clark Beckham is coming, uh, we're, I'm sure we're going to have a number of teenagers show up. Uh, you know, Clark will grow in his maturity and reach adults uh, later on in life. But church will be filled with those of us that love Clark and the stand that he took. I don't know if you know it, behind the scenes, they wanted him to sing a song from Fifty Shades of Grey, and he said, I'm not doing it. And they told him, if you don't sing this song, you won't win. He said, then I won't win. He is a man of conviction. And uh, so uh, when you see Clark, just cheer him on and stuff. Only God knows what he's going to do. I want you to stand all over this church. For the last two years, we've been having a little statement. And you may say, Maury, when did you make that statement up? I didn't make it up. Pastor George used to like to stay up all night and do stuff. And so we had Sunday morning service at Calvary. We had Sunday night service at Calvary. We had Sunday night live TV show. And then we, a live TV show. And then we left to go to Cloudcroft, New Mexico. And we had to go by way of El Paso to pick up a pastor who was flying in from somewhere else on a red-eye flight. And we have gotten to Rip's truck stop at about 3 o'clock in the morning. And he's been telling me all the way there, Maury, when we get to Rip's truck stop, you're going to love it. They still grill the old-fashioned buns. They, they do their onions on the grill, and they get their buns good and greasy and toast the buns on the grill. And he's been talking about hamburgers. I'm thinking, okay, I slept about three hours last night, and, and you know, we're going to drive all night long. We're going to play 36 holes of golf tomorrow, and, you know, I just want to sleep while you're driving. And, and he looked over at me, and he said, you know, Davis, I've been thinking about life. I'm just too blessed to be depressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. I'm sitting on top of the world, my feet hanging off. And in my spiritual thought, I said, good for you. And <laughs> however, what I learned in life was life and death really are in the power of the tongue. And if you don't say it, you're not ever going to see it. So let's say it together. I'm too blessed to be depressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. I'm sitting on top of the world with my feet hanging off. I love you, Cornerstone Nashville. Go witness to somebody. I'll see you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock.